and uh, let's walk through what you uh, what the groups came up with. Let's take maybe five or six minutes per group, and again, just give us the quick and dirty in your own words on these pseudo and advanced selectors, and maybe show us an example. And actually, if you guys did put an example into CodePen. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, save your code pin. You may have to like log in to do that. Save your code pin and dump that link into Slack, and then we can have that for reference as well if we want to play around with it. So let's start with group one, uh, David and Alejandra. One of you guys want to hop on and share your findings? David, you want to share your screen? Okay, um, so for us, okay, um, so for the very first function, uh, we have hover. Um, gonna, I don't know if this, okay. so for hover, uh, it's basically the same thing as one of the JavaScript functions, uh, where uh, once you hover over an item, um, it pretty much, um, there's an effect on it. Um, so for us, um, we change it to the background gray. I'm not sure if you can see that on the screen. Yeah. Hey, sorry. Can you uh, scroll and, up the CSS part so we can uh, see in the in the CSS? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, and actually, David, if you go down to your uh, JS window, you see that little down arrow in the JS window. If you click yeah. on that, yeah. yeah, you can minimize it. Maybe give it give you a little bit more real estate too. <clears throat> And then, um, yeah, let's see. And then the next one is visited. Um, it pretty much highlight, or it pretty much does something to any links that you've already visited. Um, so for us, uh, we changed the color to red, um, but you can change it like any other color, like let's say purple. So it changes um, any links that you've already visited. It's going to be um, so you'll know that the links already been visited uh, for us. We already clicked on it, so we can't really, I mean, unless I provide a new website, then cool. the color would be black or something. <coughs> and then for active, um, it's uh, uh, when you click on the link, it, um, like it activates the link and then it does something to it for us. We did a background yellow. So if I click on the Google, um, you'll see it's pretty quick. Um, it's going to change the highlight, um, the background of the link to yellow, like that. So. Yeah, what, what else is active really kind of commonly used for? Very similar to uh, visited. I didn't know. I, I, <coughs> like, I don't even know what the purpose of this would be. Like, yeah. So a lot of times active, uh, like if you have a nav bar, you know, maybe the, the page that you're on, maybe that nav is, is highlighted or something to show you this is where I currently am. Um, and then visited, you know, is kind of like where you've been. But uh, yeah, uh, colon active is really common with nav. Okay. And then the next um, selector is going to be the first letter. Um, it pretty much... Um, it does something to the very first letter of a, an element. Uh, in our case, we use uh, the paragraph. So um, in the line to the selector, um, the very first letter is P, um, which in here we created it to like um, the colors green, um, and then we changed the font size, like, which you yeah. can play around with. That's kind of fun. So it's like the old like, smaller. type setting days or like something. Like a fairy tale. Yeah, that's a nice effect. Yeah, that's cool. That's, that's really a really handy one. And then the first line, um, it on um, on a par uh, on an element, it highlights or it does something to the very first line of an element. So uh, before uh, we had just like um, um, it highlights the first element. So like the first line. So uh, we instead of making a very long paragraph, we just decided to put a break. Um, so it makes it a second line and then you can see how it changes that. Nice. Yeah. The, and then, so for example, like to think then, about how handy these pseudo elements are, like if I wanted to style a, a line of text or even the first letter, like the first thing that comes to my mind would be 
um, surrounding that text with span tags. The span tags, you know, are inline tags. Yeah. So you'd have to like dump in some span and then maybe put, you know, even if you want to put an ID or a class on it. And the pseudo selector, like you can keep your HTML neat and tidy. It's really, really handy. Sorry, go ahead. And then the second to last one, the uh, int child. Um, it, uh, we're not sure if it works with like um, outside of a div since um, I tried it outside and it wasn't working. Um, so I put in the div. Um, it pretty much selects um, like the number. Like it counts from the like on the div itself. It counts the number of elements. Like h three, there's three in our case. And then it counts from one. It starts at one instead of like the zero that we're normally used to in like JavaScript. So um, like you can ch change the end child from one to three. So we only have three um, elements. So it, it doesn't, <coughs> that particular pseudo, uh, pseudo selector does not use an index. It's literally like the third element. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it would be like a, an array or something like that. Yeah, it, well, it, that's what you're suggesting, David, right? So you just typed in int child three, and it looks like it affected the literally the third H three. So it's not necessarily an index. Cool. Yeah, I got from there's no zero. Yeah. Since yeah. Cool. And then the till we really didn't get to it. Yeah, um, like it was just like we found what it means, and it's uh. According to this website, oh my gosh, I lost it already. <clears throat> so from what I, I guess I just, it was like it selects the siblings or the, what was it? I, I lost the page, but it was like it selects um, the siblings of the parent or something like that. Like we could not understand this one at all. So if you could go over that, that would be great. Yeah, let me. That, that's the thing with these pseudo elements and advanced selectors. You pretty much like have to see them and play with them. Let me put in just a screenshot of like the W3 schools. But they put an example in there, like if you scroll, but that didn't work, of what we thought that would do. Um, like, so this is the tilde. So uh, in the example, I just paste it in. Man, that is, that is tiny. Selects every UL, so unordered list elements, that are preceded by a P element. So you try to do a div. So any H2 that's preceded by a div. And you were trying to change it to the color red. Would you mind, uh, let's see where your H2. Could you change uh, in your HTML, like make that blank H2 or something, just so we can, I, I do see that there's a size difference, but just so, yeah. Yeah, cool. Sorry, it's just a little, little small there. Um, so I think to get this to work, you may want to check my math. Move those H2s down below that closing div tag on line 21. Let's see if that, if that does anything. Move those. What? Yeah, so move those H2s. Down below that closing div tag on line 20. So right now your H2s are yeah. inside that div element. <clears throat> so the tilde suggests do this styling oh. to. So these H2s are immediately <clears throat> preceded by a div. So that's how that would work. Okay. So it doesn't mean it's necessarily encapsulated inside that element. It means that it that element comes before. So it's kind of a separation there. Okay. Cool. Very nice, guys. Thanks for sharing. Um, who is up? Uh, group two, Kieran and Alan. So, and then, uh, um, David, if you guys wouldn't mind, uh, if you can save your code pin and dump it in to Slack, just if anyone else wants to play with the code, it'd be awesome. Thanks. So, we didn't do the code pin thing, which maybe I'm thinking now we should have, so we understand it in theory but we didn't try it in practice, which is never a good idea with CSS because <laughs> it's tricky. <laughs> but, um, so, but so here's the theory. Uh, we had um, disabled, checked, focused, target 
only child plus and uh, greater than. And uh, so um, they're all pretty straightforward. Uh, disabled, that's a condition for the uh, disabled elements. So um, uh, if you have a form or something and you have certain parts of it disabled and you want to select a color for that, so all the, all the areas that you're supposed to fill out, you'd put like enabled yellow, background yellow, and so they'd all be uh, in yellow, and then disabled gray, so you know you can't fill those out, which... What, <clears throat> what would be an example in the blackjack game where maybe that colon disabled would be helpful? Can you think of uh, a situation? So um, if, if I got really advanced with it, it would be um, you, it would set a condition where you can't hit or stand once you bust. So then the color of those buttons would change once you bust. And so that's, that's how it would do that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> um, and uh, uh, the same thing for, for checked basically it sets the conditions for, for checked elements. And um, so in, uh, when we're looking these up, it's all very relative to something that we all do. If you like order something online, it has the, uh, the parts that you fill out on the form, like you put your credit card number, address, and all of that. And, um, and like one example is if, if your mailing address is the same as your billing address and you click that, it'll change the whole background to where you don't, to the, so that that's disabled. And, um, and then the focused one is when, uh, like, so the line that you're on might be highlighted. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it might have a, like in the one that they had in the example, it had the line that you're on, the line that you clicked on as a background color of yellow. But most the, um, or most, most of us when we order online, or for me at least, the line that I'm on is a little brighter than the other lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, focus is super helpful for forms, right? So like the actual form field that the, your cursor is in, sometimes, like you said, yeah, it's, it's highlighted differently or opacity or something. Yeah, nice. Um, Alan, do you want to talk about some or shall I continue? I can go. Um, so we did find some W3 schools examples of these also, though. Um, this is for Target. And basically, it's for if you use an anchor tag, which takes you somewhere else on the page. So like if you're in a Wikipedia article and you click on something to take you to like a different section, and it scrolls down your page, it'll highlight that section that it takes you to. Um, so here you click on new content one and it highlights that. Um, let's see. Here's the CSS for that. And then you'll notice that for the hrefs and the anchor tags, it is equal to the ID of the P tags that it's basically scrolling to. Um, yeah, that, that's awesome. That's something that we uh, may take a look at here in a moment. But earlier I mentioned how sometimes you can fake like a single page, a spa app. <clears throat> Um, and this is how you could do that is uh, like Alan mentions, you could click on something and it would scroll down to that section of the page, wherever those IDs matched up. So this is a really handy, uh, really handy trick. That's cool. All right. The next one we had was the only child selector. So basically this selects um, the, let's see, what is it? It's basically, elements that are the only child of their parent elements. So in this example, this P tag here is the only child of its parent element, which is the div tag. Um, these down here, none of those, this div tag right here has multiple children, so it doesn't get selected. Um, so this first line up here is the only one that gets colored red by the only child selector. Um, let's see. Next one was the plus selector. Um, 
basically it selects I didn't knowing I didn't know what the tilted tag did or the tilde selector did before this, and I don't really understand the difference between the two, but it does basically the same thing where it selects um an element whose preceding element is something. So here it selects this p tag um because it's preceded by a div. There's the selector right here. Yeah. Um I don't know, Mark, could you explain the difference between the two? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's kind of a yin and a yang, just depending on your preference. I think what you could do, I, I think this would work <clears throat> if you did p tilde div. I think that may give you the same effect if you use the tilde. I think you would just need to reverse the selectors. I think that that would be similar. Okay. Because the tilde is something that's before and the plus sign is something, uh, by definition, something that's after. So it's tomato, tomato. Um, but if you wanted to check that out, if you did P tilde div, and let's see if we get the same behavior. Oh, it's not letting me edit it for some reason. Okay, so the selects all p. I think it might be a div tilde p. Okay. Mm. Uh, so tilde, it looks like tilde selects all of the ones that that's the case. Yeah. Whereas plus like every p. element. Yeah. So a really small, you know, intricate difference, but. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So the next one is the um, greater than selector. Um, let's see if I can remember what this one does. So, gosh, I forgot what this one did. Yeah, so the, <clears throat> the greater than should select all elements where the parent is a particular element. So the way you have it, uh, I think that the way you have it set up, yeah. So it selects, yeah, go ahead. It, since it's selecting for a, it's basically looking for a P tag whose parent is a div tag. Nice. So yep. it winds up selecting this P tag right here. Mm -hmm. Why doesn't it select the I will not be styled P? Because its parent is a spam tag. Yeah, nice. Then what's the parent of the uh, my best friend is Mickey? Uh, the body tag. Yeah, and so uh, indenting all of the so it looks like your indentation is a little off. That's okay, but indentation would help you know visualize that a little better as well. Right. Is that a hockey uh, hockey stick for your cursor there, your pointer? No. <laughs> uh, I guess it just looks different on Zoom. It looks like a little. Hockey stick. I was to say, how, how did you do that? That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, it's just a normal arrow on my screen. Okay. <laughs> that must be a Zoom thing. Interesting. Um, cool. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, group three, Matt and Sophia. So I think, yeah. So what I've shared down here um, is like a list of examples that this is coming like straight from Matt's notes. Um, and we actually, these are kind of like, these are new examples than the examples we found on W3 schools. Um, I'll share my screen because we just started working on the code. Um, cool. And so we're kind of stuck on this. Mark, because we expected that this method would work, but everything is green. So what have I done wrong here? Let's come back to the knot. I actually thought I had taken that out of the list because knot's a little tricky one. Let's just skip that one for now. Okay. Yeah. So we have some of these here. So the first one, 
for example. Well, this is doing the same thing. I would assume that the color would just change on the H1, right? Or it would take that out because it wouldn't select it at all. That because it selects every indicated element. Well, so what's the definition of the empty pseudo selector? What is it supposed to do? It would just take the element that has no children. Yeah, so it looks like for this one, um, because if you look at the definition, it also suggests text nodes. So a yeah. text node counts as a child. <clears throat> and so it looks like inside your H1, you actually have a text node, and that text node is hello world. Mm -hmm. So I think if you, um, I think if you got rid of the hello world inside it, and maybe if you just put some properties on that H1, like a you know width and height of 100 px and a background color of red, mm -hmm. um, I think that it would affect it that way. So if the H1 was empty, if it didn't have a text node, but I, um, so I think you'd want to put these, these the width and height you'd want to put on H1. I think if you wanted to see that H1 uh, change. Yeah, we can try it that way too. And maybe put a, a background color so it'll show up. Yeah, that makes sense. And you have to take out the hello world and the H1 tag. Yeah. Get it out of here. Um, the second one, I think. Well, it should do both, I think. Any H1. Cool. And then if you can get rid of the space in between that H1. Oh, yes. I think maybe that's affecting it. There we go. Oh, there we go. Yeah. But it's here. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, so something to keep in mind. Um, and this really comes into play with the jQuery children versus child methods. So I forget which one it is. You may want to check my math. One of those counts text nodes as children. And so you can see here that a text node, even if there's a space in between opening and closing tags, the DOM will render that as a text node. And you can see that if you inspect the element in the um, inspect elements tab in your dev tools, you can see that like the DOM does account for that empty, you know, space or whatever. But yeah. Cool. Thanks. What's next? Uh, after and before. Yes. So. So I can just probably create a new one. I wonder what I, I could insert here. Um, Maybe you want to put, uh, yeah, what's something that we could do there? Try this. This is from W3 schools. Okay. Maybe this will be for funsies. Let me paste this into Slack. <clears throat> Try using that content. Um, yeah. Okay. And it puts it right directly after it or yeah. And keep in mind, like some of these pseudo selectors, I, for example, I don't really know if I would like use that after or before to like insert text, but I would potentially use it as a jQuery, you know, to pass in a, a selector into jQuery. Like if maybe I'm um, dealing with a to-do list, 
then maybe once I click an item on my to-do list as done, maybe I want like a smiley face to appear, you know, before that item or something. So I might not necessarily, you know, hard code it into CSS, but I could certainly use these pseudo selectors, you know, in the context of uh, DOM manipulation with jQuery or JavaScript. So. Yeah, that, that, makes sense. that actually makes more sense than just using this in CSS. Yeah. Cool. And then, yeah, so after would be, you know, after an in, in element versus before. So cool. Last child. I have a couple of examples for before last child and then the remaining two. Sure. Can you all see that? It looks good. Cool. So for before, what I did is before. Basically, it selects all the p tags and it enters content before the actual text. So I have a couple of p tags, and you can see I had more text. And here it added more text in front of each of these different p tags. Um, the next one, last child, basically what it does is it looks for the last child within a specific, um, you know, within the. Uh, indicated element and it adds something to it. So for the last child, basically it looked where the P tag was the last child and it added green uh, color text to it. Um, let's see, and then the article, one, the attribute one, um, this is one that I was actually having a little bit of trouble with, which uh, where it should happen is, it selects all elements within a targeted element and so I was trying to get it with this piece of code here mm -hmm. because I wanted it to target these P tags with the class article and change the color to red. Um, let me see. So any... There was, you know, there was something, something I did differently there. I guess I got it confused with the, with the final one which is where it selected the class article and it made the text red for this paragraph. Yeah, well, <clears throat> so consider if you were going, like, what line is that? Your, your class equals article, I, like, I would just do dot article for that one. I don't know if that would be. In this one? Well, not necessarily that one, but the, the second one that you have there. So you're, yeah, I would just probably just do dot article instead of like grab the attribute class equals article. That's a little, maybe a little redundant there. Um, but as far as the one, yeah, I would get rid of the, I, I, I wouldn't use that attribute for okay. a class. I would just put in like dot article. I, so I'd get rid of the quotes and the, um, but what the brackets are good for, we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, something like, I think W3 schools uses target as an attribute that maybe you would look for. Um, also, if you're looking for a uh, particular input type in a form, so Matt, I would even get rid of those uh, uh, square brackets. So if I, I, I wouldn't put, give me the class equals article because dot article is the same thing as selecting everything with the article class. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, we'll see uh, here in a little bit. So the square brackets are really good if you're trying to style a form, for example. So a form has different types of inputs, right? It maybe has like a text input for name, first name, last name. Maybe it has an um, email field input, you know, which is styled a little differently. Maybe a telephone input. So using those are pretty handy for like styling forms and such. As far as the P class caret equals article. So these are really like, if you really want to get specific. So the caret would select any element whose attribute starts with the value equals. So any P that had a class of article. So did that one actually, did that one work, Matt? Yeah, it oh, basically yeah. Okay, is so that's the, color, color, the red style thing. Right nice. Here. So maybe if you had, for example, that would be handy if you had classes, maybe you had an article class, maybe an articles class, Maybe an, um, you know, something, it, it's kind of like doing a regex, like you're looking for a pattern. So grab all of these articles, um, excuse me, all of the elements 
with a class that starts with the value of article. So it would grab article, articles, whatever, I don't know, whatever extra articles you could put at the end of the word article. But yeah, things like that are really handy. And there's also some more um, advanced selectors that will just grab like a portion of a value. So grab me any element that the value of an attribute has, you know, TIC inside it. You know, so maybe you have article, maybe you have a class of Tic Tac or something. <laughs> maybe you want to style all of those. So, um, yeah, very nice. Were there any or uh, any more that you guys had? Uh, no, I think that was the entire list that we nice. had. Very cool. Um, so let's take it home. Uh, Audrey and Michael. So we, and, and Mike, can, you can always chime in with me. Um, we kind of just went through the art, went through the elements and talked about the different examples so we can try to understand that where they would be. We didn't really write our, our, our examples down, um, but we do have some explanation for them and what, what we came up together with. So um, I just did a quick code pen. I can. Uh, perfect. Yeah. Sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, share my screen. All right, you see this part, right? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, just go through. I'll, I'll read them out and then we can kind of just pull it in. <laughs> I'll help sure. you out there. Um, so the first one we had, and, and he'll show you his, on his examples, and you I just, just not looking at them, um, was first type of, first of type, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, He'll pull that up and he'll show you the idea that we had um, when we were reading it first of type. And this also kind of leaks into the other things too. Um, it selects the first type of the element. So this by itself can sound like this, um, this by itself can sound pretty simple and straightforward. But then you start thinking about the other ones like last type and only of type. And this is where we had a lot of conversation. So first of type literally means the first of type. So when you think about mathematically, if you're dealing with a question, the first thing listed is the first of that type, um, first element of that type makes sense. But then if it's the only one, it's also going to still be the first because it's the first one listed. So um, he can show you an example, but pretty much all it really just means is very literally the first type of that element that you're attaching it to. And I say that specifically because I think when you hear the other ones, it starts to make it sound a little bit more confusing. So just remember again, literally the first type of something. So, um, yeah, so in this case, uh, and this is a beautiful example because this is what we're actually working on to be perfectly straightforward with you guys. So, cool. Yeah, so the first, uh, the first type does is it highlights the first H2 uh, within, I guess within a section is what it seems to be doing. Um, so it's getting the yeah. first of type for each of these divs uh, versus last of type it's the last one within each. And if you notice, it still selected the one from the top section where it is a diff by itself. And this is where I mean you have to very literally think of first and very literally think of last. Because even though it's only <coughs> one, both the first and the last, because if you think numerically, it's still one and two, even if it's the only one in there. Yeah. So uh, you, is the computer is just thinking very literally first of type and last of type based on the sections that they find them inside. Your right. Yeah, that's a really good point. So remember the, uh, if we did, um, you know, document dot get elements by class name. So remember that even if we only had one element with that specific class name, it's still going to be returned in an array. So it's kind of the same thing, even though there's only one of these, it's still like the first and the last of something. So yeah, it's a really good point. Really yeah. Good. And it is also the only so that first one qualifies for only since it's mm. by itself. 
Yeah. And that one we had fun with too, because uh, <laughs> we were thinking to ourselves, in which case would you want the only yeah. of something? Because <laughs> I could also just like, or make an idea and not have to use that. Yeah. I will say, I told, I was telling him, and I, and I probably was not explaining this really well, so please ask questions. When I was doing my Connect Four, I had faced a problem where I wanted to call something, and it already had a class, and ten, no, it already had an ID, and I was already talking in class, so I couldn't use class, and I couldn't use ID, but I didn't want to drop either or, because it was making another function work. So in that really one-off situation, this would have been the situation where I would have used that, but that's mm -hmm. not something that you typically set yourself up to put yourself into. So, um, what I said was maybe if you're building off someone else, like if you're building off of me, you would have needed to know to do that because I, again, use a class and an ID on an element already to make other functions work. And then when I needed a new function and I still needed to call that element again, but I needed a very specific element, not, not all of them, that would have probably been a really good way to be like only that type of element. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, some of these are really kind of wonky, right? I mean, these wouldn't like come top of mind immediately as I'm doing code, but maybe to refactor your stuff, you know, some of these would come in really handy. Like my HTML is really verbose. There's a lot of classes and IDs. You know, so maybe like going back on something that you already built, uh, these would come in really handy now that you've kind of been exposed to them. Yeah, I guess it just seems kind of wonky to do it this way versus like the other way. Uh, with classes and IDs because like if like this is a good example so if I'm trying to get that second one but then I add a like add a new page two oops then all of a sudden I like now this one is highlighted instead of maybe I wanted this one to remain highlighted so yeah. I, I well, mess that up if instead of if I just use an ID. Anth of types are really good. So you only have, you know, like four, you know, H's or, or H elements here. But consider if you have like a huge data set, like a huge table, and you see this a lot, maybe with bootstrap and stuff, how it's like, you know, white and gray, white and gray, which helps for readability. So maybe if yeah. you have like a huge list or something, uh, maybe the nth of type would be handy to help for readability or something. Uh, so if you have a lot of elements that you're trying to do something with, maybe the nth of type would be super appropriate for that, you know? Yeah. That was one of the examples Mike actually came up with when we were thinking about like newspaper articles and um, mm -hmm. a lot of times they repeat a lot of what they want to have happen, but they're still individualistically articles. So in one case, you might want the heading to say this, but you don't want to mess with the other headings. Mm -hmm. But maybe yeah. you need to only pick that one thing. Yeah, we were yeah. thinking for like, maybe because the newspaper like the main the first headline of the first page is much bigger than the rest so that would yeah. be a good example for first of type yeah that's a yeah that's a really good point yeah yeah all right cool. and then first uh, uh child it's pretty yeah. nice. it's pretty much like the first of type yeah nice of type just that index of that type you want it, it kind of falls into the same pattern. Yeah, gotcha. and then just quickly for the other attribute ones, uh, a star one, if it contains it at all, it'll do it. So um, for this example, the, days, uh, the test is here and here. So mm -hmm. even though this is a much longer class name, it still identifies that part is contained. Yeah, kind of like a regex, right? I'm looking for a pattern of T-E-S-T. -E right, right. Nice. Cool. Uh, but I for this one, okay. if it contains it at all, or if it contains it like explicitly versus, uh, so this, in this case, example that they gave, uh, you see that flowers is this one, but it's not identified. It only takes specifically flower. Yeah, flower versus the earlier example um, with the carrot. I think the right. carrot would look for something that starts with. Uh, so you if know, I put the carrot, flower. I think both would be highlighted because it still identifies yeah. flowers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
flower, flowers, flower garden. I don't know, something like that. Yeah. Cool. Great work. Um, well, thanks for going through all that, you guys. I hope, you know, kind of the point of this was just to get a little bit of exposure to these pseudo and advanced selectors. You may not use them all the time. You may not use them at all, but uh, they're definitely out there. And I would also encourage you to think about these not only for strictly CSS, but for your JavaScript jQuery DOM manipulation. These can come in really handy. Um, let's take a 10 minute break. We'll come back. There's just a couple other quick things I want to touch on, and then I have a little bit of a lab for you guys to work on. So let's regroup at 12.46 p.m. Let's keep it moving. Um, so what I'd like to do, I want to try to get you guys into lab time, like right around one-ish. So you guys did a really great job of pretty much touching on everything else that I wanted to do in the lesson. So what I think we'll do in the next like 15 or so minutes, I'm going to send you guys a code pin and I've already put in like most of the code from the lesson. So if you guys want to click on that, be sure to fork it, you may need to log in and then fork it. If you want to play around with the code yourself as we walk through these examples, I just wanted to show you guys a couple more odds and ends of things you can do with pseudo and advanced selectors. If you just want to watch me, that's totally cool as well. But I just went ahead and created a pin um, to make it a little bit easier than me cutting and uh, pasting code. So you are welcome to that. Um, let's take a few minutes and walk through a few more examples and then we'll get you guys to lab time again. I'm going to share my screen. And I wanted to talk politics for a minute. No, I'm kidding. Don't want to talk politics. I have a question for you guys. So this is a really common, uh, really nice use case for using pseudo selectors. So for example, here's the CNN website, obviously. Uh, and we, here we have a nav bar. You guys are pretty savvy at that. So a nav bar is usually, if you want to come on mic, or if you want to put it in, or, or if you want to put it into Slack, what would be kind of the most common way, generally speaking, to create a nav bar? Like what, what is underneath the hood of a nav bar generally? This may have been in your uh, pre-work, but what would be like a really quick and dirty way to create a nav bar? It's just a bunch of anchor tags floated to the left. Yeah, more specifically, I would suggest that it could be an unordered list and each uh, each anchor tag, you know, is inside of an LI, let's say. And then, yeah, absolutely. You probably want to float them or do like a display inline block or something. Uh, but here, here's my point. So you see how in the nav, see how there's like a little pipe in between each anchor tag? We also have like kind of a hover pseudo class, which is pretty cool. But let's say that I have a rule where I'm gonna add a pipe, like a little you know, vertical, really faint gray line in between each LI in my nav. Now I don't necessarily want to put this pipe over here at the end, nor would I wanna put it like right here at the beginning of my nav bar. So what could be a strategy, uh, given what we just went over, to maybe make this nav bar play nicely where I don't want that extra pipe on these, you know, kind of the first and the last elements in my nav. How could we approach that? Could maybe use that after selector. Yeah, you could do an after. And that's maybe, something to not have it on the video. I thought maybe um, it'll be like first child and last child. So yeah. Like yeah, that was, yeah, so after is really good, but my, the, like the first thing that popped in my head, which just would be a, a really great use case for this, is maybe a first child and a last child. So maybe the first LI, you know, the first child LI or the last child LI, you know, maybe you could turn off that pipe or something. Um, just a suggestion. But NAVs are really, really great use cases for those specific pseudo selectors. You know, if you want to turn off, let's say that you have some padding or border around each LI in your NAV, but maybe you don't want it on like the end 
uh, selector or, or the end uh, nav links because you want it maybe flush with the edge of the page or something. Uh, in that type of situation, you know, pseudo selector would be really handy. So I just wanted to show you guys that. Something to tuck away in the old noggin. Alrighty, can you guys see my code pen and such as? Give me a nice cheesy thumbs up if you can see my code pen. So when I'm sharing my screen, thank you. When I'm sharing my screen, I can only see like uh, like two people, but cool. So let me make this a little larger. I just want to walk through a few really quick examples before we move forward. Um, and again, these are also, whoa, that's pretty large. These are also in the lesson if you want to revisit these later. But the first thing I wanted to touch on is this kind of math that we can do. I forget which group touched on this, but the nth child, nth of type, anytime you see that nth, we can play around with like some math, some variables and such. So let's take a look at how that works. So if you're looking at the code pen, I just threw together an unordered list with six LIs. And let's say for whatever reason, I wanted to apply um, a particular CSS rule to maybe every third LI element. Well, the way that I could do that, for example, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of ways to do this, is I could use LI and the pseudo selector nth child. And then what I would pass in there is every third child, make it the color red, make the font color red. Um, but this 3n is really kind of the key. If I wanted to do, you know, maybe the second one, every, every second item, I could do a 2n, and that would grab every second one. Or if I wanted to do uh, even an easier one, a more simpler way, let's say that I wanted every even item in this li to style it a particular way. You also have at your disposal, you have even, and you also have odd, which is really handy. So you can do even and odd. You can literally just pass in those words. So just something to tuck away. Uh, those are really easy ways. You know, maybe if you have some sort of data that you want to make more readable, sometimes that's a really, uh, really handy one. You can also, let's say that you wanted to style starting at the end of the list backward. You can also do negative values in here. And let me paste in, I'll put this into Slack. Let's take a look at this example. So this one, li nth child negative n plus four. I'm getting a little, little wacky now. But let's see what that does. So if I do negative n plus four, if I save that. So that's actually gonna select the, the first four items. Starting at the beginning. I could do a negative n plus five. Let's see if we have another one in here. You can also chain these pseudo selectors together. So let me show you guys this one. This is getting a little wonky, but kind of like jQuery, how we can chain methods together. If you play your cards right, you can also chain these pseudo selectors together. So let's say that I wanted to only create a rule for the second through the fifth LIs in this particular list. I could do something like this. So I could take the second child all the way up to the fifth child. And I can only create a, a, create a rule that would only apply to those specific elements. So just as an example, just wanna show, show you how you can chain these together. So let me chain this to uh, like n plus two. Nth child, and then they have n plus five. And then if I save that, and so you can see there that it's actually only applied to the second through the fifth uh, element there. So um, again, just wanted to point that out. If you're playing around with the CSS and you're using these nths, that you can pass in even and odd. And then you also have at your disposal this negative. Um, you can also make a negative n value. Some of this would have been helpful in the homework last night. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. I think we mentioned, um, because we had to kind of reconfigure the, the unit one. Uh, we tried to front load all the JavaScript before the break. And then I think we mentioned that this week was going to be like kind of the CSS and stuff. So, so yeah, but um, yeah, this definitely would have been helpful with the homework for sure. Let's take a look at forms 
and then uh, how we can like fake single page apps um, and then we'll move forward to lab time. So if you go to the code pen, if you're following along at home, I'm just going to comment out the UL and then I put a janky form in here. So if you want to uncomment out these lines. And then let's take a look at uh, just really quickly how we can use these selectors to style forms specifically. Uh, let me comment out these input rules real quick so we can see what our form would look like without the selectors. So this is a pretty basic radio button type of a form. Um, radio buttons are I don't know. I guess they're cool. <laughs> they're not always like the most stylish way to, to do a form, but there's a couple of ways that we could like fake this out. And so I wanted to show you guys a strategy for radio buttons um, using these pseudo and advanced selectors. So let's take a look at that. So we can see kind of the before, before we pop this thing in the oven. We have, you know, USA, Britain, Mother Russia. These are pretty basic uh, input input types and such for radio. But go ahead and uncomment out or decomment out those rules for the form and let's let's take a look at what we can accomplish. So now these we still have that radio button functionality in that if we were submitting a form, so a radio button generally the idea is that if you have you know three things to choose from, you could only choose one, right? That's kind of the idea of a radio button. So one of these is gonna be passed to the server side as true because it's selected. The other two will you know, be passed as false or whatever. Um, but we can still click on this and this is still a radio button, but now it's a little, it, it, it looks a little better. The UI is a little bit more appealing. And so we can accomplish this with just a couple of CSS rules. So just wanted to point this out. So the first thing that we did is I'm gonna grab every input element specifically those with the type of radio. So one of you groups had this selector, this advanced selector. So I'm gonna grab whatever input has an attribute of type with a uh, value of radio. And so that's, that's what we're using here, kind of an attribute selector. And so I'm just making the, I, I'm actually shrinking up the radio buttons. So I'm making them one PX height and width, uh, overflow hidden, position absolute, and then the opacity, I mean, this thing, you just cannot see it. So it's like 0.01 opacity. The radio buttons are still there, however. They're underneath the hood. So if I change this to like 50px and 50px, and if I save this, I need to change the opacity as well. Well, I'm just gonna comment out opacity. So there's our janky radio buttons. So they still exist, right? It's kind of like a cool little CSS-y trick. Um, I think Colin yesterday mentioned that website, uh, CSS Tricks. I don't know if we put it into Slack, but it's a really fun site to show you all kind of like uh, really cool ways to style your stuff in a more appealing way. So just to point out, the radio buttons are there. Let me change this back to the way it was. So we still have that radio uh, selector have the inputs. Uh, down here, I'm gonna apply to every input of type radio, uh, specifically if it also has a, a label tag. So if you take a look inside the HTML box here, all of these inputs have a label tag, you know, directly after um, each input, just to kind of tell you what you're selecting. So for these, I'm gonna do a display block, making the uh, background color the hash EEE, -E -E, and then the font color or color of uh, 369, whatever that is. And then down here, I'm kind of doing the opposite. So once I select a radio button using the pseudo checked, then I'm, I'm pretty much just inversing the colors, right? So you can see the difference. So if I check on USA, I just flip it so the background's blue and the color is gray, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so we accomplished this with three rules. It makes our janky little input form a little bit more appealing. Uh, but this is a really great use case. You guys will use this not unfrequently, particularly this attribute. So if I wanted to make a style that would only affect like um, input of type text. So maybe like the name, uh, first name, last name, address fields, things like that. So you have a lot of, uh, 
a lot of customization that you can throw into your stuff. Any questions about that? Again, you don't have to memorize this stuff. It's just, you know, you'll, you'll see this out there and sometimes just to keep it in the back of your head if you want to style something specifically. Okay, last thing I wanted That's, to show you guys. Yeah, go ahead. That's a question. So yeah. there was one, uh, the bottom one, input type radio checked. Mm -hmm. So that's when it um, is when we check it. But it looked like when it looked like it was almost when you hovered over it, or when you checked other ones, it changed it. So I wasn't sure if I understood what you were saying there correctly. So when you put that that pseudo selector checked, it's saying if you click it and so kind of like if you check it off, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, checked is a little misleading because there's also like a check box input type, you know, this is so a check box is literally like a true or false value, right? Um, the radio input type, like I, maybe I'm maybe the point of this is to say like, you know, uh, a country of origin or like, you know, what country um, are you from? I don't know, something like that. I know I'm not spelling that correctly. Like a, like a like one of those census value ones or something like that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a radio button inherently, the, the point of a radio button is that one of them is selected or checked. So in this case, we can use, uh, in this case, all of the labels right now have a gray background and a, a blue, bluish color, right? So the font is kind of a blue. However, when I check one of these, I'm just gonna change the background color to blue and make the color gray. Um, this could be, anything. I mean, I could make this like yellow and then the color red. But all this is saying is once I check on one of these, I want to apply a different rule to it so that I can visually see what I've selected. Because I hid that janky radio button. Remember the radio button is still here. It's just like really, really small. It's invisible. But this is just like a little hack you can do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think I, I think what I was, I was um, expecting was that it was like, if it's been checked at any point, but it's just was most actively checked because of those radio buttons. Yeah, because a radio button, uh, only one can be checked at a time. Uh, let me see if I can make it, let me make the radio button show up. Maybe that'll be a little clearer. So here we have the radio buttons. So whichever one I select, you know, yeah. Okay, cool. Just a fun little, fun little hack there. Okay, last thing. Alan says that there are reasons to do 01 opacity versus zero. Um, check, check my math. Please check my math on this. I need to Google it. But I think if you do opacity zero, I think maybe it doesn't even register in the DOM. Like it may not be clickable. I may be off on that, um, but just, just check that. I think it will like, Maybe it even does like a display none, which means it's not even clickable. It just completely doesn't appear at all. Um, I can look that up later though. That's a good question. Uh, finally, pagination. So one of you, uh, one of the groups did mention this, which was really awesome, but I just want to give you guys a quick demo. So this is the idea, let's say that you have kind of a nav and you want to scroll to different parts on the page. Oops. So if you wanna kind of deselect this last section, man, that's what happens when your stuff is magnified like crazy. So let me, let me deselect this and just show you guys this really quick. So here I have a nav, um, down here in the CSS, I have a section rule and then I have a section rule with the pseudo selector of target. And target, remember, is like when something's selected. Um, actually, it's when something's selected, then it affects some other element. So the way that this is set up is when I click on, right now, uh, both of these sections, this about me and this contact, they're hidden because I have display none. But when I click on one of these uh, anchor tags in my nav, I want to see the appropriate section. So if I click on about me, there's about me, there's contact. So this is another cool little tool if you wanna paginate your stuff. Let me show you another example of this because this is really common 
uh, pretty much in GitHub and all of our lessons, it does this as well. So let me show you what I'm talking about when I talk about pagination. So if I go to today's lesson, um, it has to do with how we structure the lessons. So we write these lessons in a language called Markdown. But if you look at the README, if you hover over here to the left-hand side of each kind of like H, I think these are like H2 sections, you'll see this little link appear if you hover over it. So if I click here to advance selectors, it pretty much goes to that section of the page. And then notice here in the URL window area that I get a little hash to the advanced dash selector section. Or let's go down here to scavenger, scavenger hunt. So if I wanted to send you guys a link and have you go directly to this section of the page, it's, it's termed pagination. Uh, so I could do that. So for example, if you guys want to click on that link, it should go to today's lesson, but specifically to this section of the page. So sometimes this is really handy if you have like a really long page, maybe for your portfolio pages, for example, maybe you want to have it, uh, which is actually, I think, a pretty cool way to design it. Maybe you want it all to be one flowing page. So you maybe you have like an about me section, then maybe like a section for your projects with like links to your GitHubs. Maybe you want a section down at the bottom for contact. Uh, maybe a section below it with like your, you know, kind of your CV, your, you know, recent work history or something. I don't know. But if you want all that in one page, you could still have some links at the top that would go directly to my portfolio or directly, you know, scroll down to my about me or, or contact information. So you can accomplish that using uh, CSS and these selectors. And then this is just an example of, you know, how you can do that. Um, so Again, there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with pseudo and advanced selectors other than just styling things. So, you know, just keep that in mind. I'll put a pin in it right there. I want to get you guys to uh, lab time and the time we have left. But do you guys have any questions about what we've covered uh, kicking the tires this morning with pseudo and advanced selectors? Oh, let me send you guys this link as well. Here's another example. Uh, this is in the lesson. Uh, if you click on this uh, example from Stack Overflow, you'll notice that you get a little bit of like a cool little orange flash when you go to the section of the page. Um, and that's the same, you know, kind of the same premise in that you're going to a specific, if you look at the URL, you see there's like a hash and then it goes to a specific section of that page. So you don't have to scroll through it. So sometimes that's really handy. All righty, friends. Uh, let me slack out uh, kind of your lab time if you want to work on it in the next 20 minutes. It's in your student labs folder for today. And I'll slack it out just in case you're, um, you're looking for it. So there's two labs in there, but I think I'll give you guys this one. This is kind of a fun one. This is called American uh, CSS. And uh, I'll pop it in here. While I'm sharing my screen, I'll show you guys. So if you wanna click on that link, I'll put you guys back into your breakout so you can kind of hack on this up until lunch. But it's pretty simple. I want you guys, there's some starter code here provided. Uh, there's an index.html. Uh, the only thing you'll need to touch is the flag.css. So you don't need to mess around with the HTML at all. I just want you guys to add the CSS rules that would turn the HTML into something that looks like an American flag. Uh, so without touching flag.html, touching only flag.css, and without using any images, uh, make the content of flag.html look like this American flag in your browser. Uh, I'll push up a solution this afternoon, but the solution um, that I have, uh, it's actually pretty, not too crazy. I only had uh, three selectors, in four properties. That isn't the only or the best solution necessarily, but just to let you know, um, you're pretty much going to be using, let's go into the flag.css. Oh my gosh, did I actually push up the uh, solution already? Oh goodness. Oh goodness, what an oversight. Okay, well, I think I've pushed up the solution already, guys. Maybe I didn't push up the bonus. So there's a bonus involved. 
uh, making the blue part of this flag have 50 white stars. So you'll want to Google um, maybe for ASCII characters, there's a specific code, you know, to make a star. So you want to Google that and then throw that into the blue part. Um, yeah, I think the solution is in flag.css. So just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Uh, but what you could do actually, if you wanted, is just go into the index.html and create some style tags in the head and just play around with the CSS if you want. But this flag is actually a fancy table, really, pretty janky. But you can take a look at the CS, uh, at the HTML. You're gonna wanna create attribute selectors and probably play around with the row span and the column span. So that's a little bit of a hint. And then also you're gonna wanna do some styling, uh, some rules to like these, uh, all these TDs for each, uh, for each role, for each row. So for that, you may want to use like an odd or an even or an nth of type, you know, something like that. We, we can work on this without seeing the solution, right? It's, is it, yeah, is it? that's what I was saying. So um, I'll push up the solution with the stars uh, later today. But yeah, it looks like I pushed up the wrong CSS file. But what I was saying is that if you want to, uh, if you want to play nicely, I would just go in here to the HTML and throw some janky style tags up in the head. So remember, that's one way to add CSS to your to your project. Um, you could actually just dump this whole thing into CodePen and then just play around with the CSS rules there as well. Actually, that's not a bad idea if you wanted to do that. Or the other thing is you could create you know another uh, .css file and link it up and put it in there if you want. But anyway, uh, so <laughs> that's what we'll hack on for about the next eighteen minutes. Um,